Well, welcome to our meeting today at Clark Street. I was almost going to say this morning, but it's just turned 12.02, so it's this afternoon. Uh, welcome to our meeting, whether you're here in person at our building or whether you are meeting us uh, online. Uh, either locally or further afield. It's so good to have you here with us. Um, my name is Mark Rushworth. I'm one of the uh, leaders here at Christ Central Church here in Fredericton. And we're so thrilled to be meeting back together in person again um, in this building, in this new building that God has provided for us. Um, but we also know that some people aren't able to join with us for different reasons. And uh, so we're very glad that you're joining with us online as well, whether you're watching this uh, on Sunday or another day. It's just great to have you here with us. And we're going to continue as a church to be doing things online and in person. Um, this evening, for example, we're going to be praying together and that's going to be online. It's going to be on our Zoom call as we've done before. In the future, we may well have some prayer times in person as well. So we're just going to try and keep both of those strands going as we go forward. Over the last few months, we've been preaching through the book of Philippians, and right now we're halfway through chapter 2, and last week Joe preached on verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2. So why don't we start from reading those verses and go on from there up to verse 18. It says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So last Sunday, Joe was looking at what it means to work out our salvation. And uh, it's important to have that as the context of the next part that we're going to go into. So I'm just going to revisit that a little bit in case you weren't here or in case you didn't hear. What does it mean, work out your salvation? Because work it out can mean a lot of different things in the English language. Paul isn't meaning figure it out. He, doesn't, he isn't saying figure out how you can get saved. Because Paul spends a lot of time in his letters pointing out that we can't do anything to save ourselves. We can't do anything to make ourselves good enough for a holy God. Everything that we have as Christians is a free gift from God. That is the gospel. Romans 5 says, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the heart of the gospel. It's all grace. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. It's all grace, and God sets us free. So what is it that Paul's saying? Work out your salvation. Does it mean once we're made right with God, we're on our own, and then it's down to us to work out things, work so that we can repay God? Some people think that that's what we've got to do when we become a Christian. They think, well, Jesus gave everything for us, so now we have to give everything for him. We have to spend the rest of our lives trying to be good, trying to please him, working hard. Maybe eventually we can feel like we've paid him back. I mean, it's often like that in life, isn't it, about paying things back. We might buy something that we couldn't afford. Maybe we buy a house. Maybe we buy a brand new vehicle, a car, a truck. And then we spend the next years of our life, maybe sometimes even the rest of our life, working on paying it back, paying back what we couldn't afford actually outright in the first place. Or kids, you might be thinking, well, I'd really like to get the new PlayStation 5 when it comes out, or the new Xbox Series X when that comes out. And your parents might say to you, well, okay, well, we'll get it for you, but you know what? You're going to have to do some chores around the house. You're going to have to be nice to your sister or brother. You're going to just have to earn it. You're going to have to pay it off. That's not what the gospel is like. The gospel is a free gift. There are no strings attached at all. 
It's completely free. So what is it that Paul is saying to work it out? Well, Paul is saying that there are things that we do. There are things that we do as a response to the gospel. So we're to work it out, not figure it out, but to live it out. Or you could just switch the words around and say, we're to outwork it. We could outwork what God's already done in us. Even that isn't for us to do on our own. Paul says, because it's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So we're outworking it, but as we're outworking it, God is working in us. He's working it out in us. So what specifically is he doing in us? He's working it in us to will and to act. There's a word that some people like to use to describe this whole thing, which is sanctification. Uh, kids, have you ever noticed that sometimes adults use long words that make them sound really clever, probably cleverer than they really are? Um, an easier way to say sanctification is actually just God is making us more like Jesus. That's probably a better way of saying it anyway. You can say either. You can say sanctification if you want to sound clever. But God is making us more like Jesus. He's making us more like God. We're becoming more holy. Remember, earlier on in chapter 2, Paul's been encouraging us to be more like Jesus. He's encouraged us to follow the example of Jesus and how he lived. But God isn't saying it in this way. He's not sitting up in heaven looking down on us and saying, come on, work it out, shape up, figure it out, get it sorted. He's not become a distant God anymore. He's not gone back, or he never was a distant God. And he's not like a sports coach who just comes on the field from time to time and gives us a kind of pep talk and motivates us and then said, right, off you go, go and figure it out. No, God is at work in us, in us all the time, working in us. His presence is always with us. And he's working in us to act according to his good purpose. He's working in us so that we can do these things, do the things that he's planned for us to do. He fills us with his Holy Spirit so that we can do things that we could never have done before. He's already made us a new person, but now he's filling us with his Holy Spirit and he's saying, you can be more like Jesus. I'm giving you the power to do it. But he's also working in us to will. And what does that mean? Because that's a key thing. It changes everything. To will something means to want to do it. It means our hearts are changed. Our minds are changed. God changes our minds about something. He changes our hearts. He changes our desires. He changes what we want to do. When I was younger, do you know what the most boring activity that I could imagine doing with my family was? Any, any guesses as to what the most boring thing that I could ever want to do was? said that in the morning meeting and someone said, preach. <laughs> I'll tell you what it was. The thing that I found the most boring as a child was going to the garden center. Going to the garden center. Oh my word. I mean, for some people, it's the highlight of 2020. Um, they're looking forward to it. It still haven't been yet. Uh, but every so often, spring would come. It didn't even have to be spring. And my parents would, would get us in the car and they'd say, come on, we're going to the garden center. And, and, I would, and my response would be, do I have to? Do I have to go to the garden center? Oh, it's so boring. And they'd say, yep, we're going to the garden center. And so we'd walk around and we'd be looking at all these trees and these plants and they all looked the same to me. And they'd all got confusing Latin names and I didn't understand any of it. And I'd be like, what? so many more things I would want to be doing. It would be deadly. I couldn't wait until I got old enough to not have to go with them to the garden center. And I did get old enough. And then when I was 21, I met Debbie, who's now my wife. And do you know what one of De Debbie's favorite activities is? <laughs> oh, yes. Going to the garden center. She loved it. She still loves it. And so she'd say, why don't we go to the garden center today? 
And I would think, I can give you a list of reasons why we don't go to the garden center today. But I'd be like, really? And she'd say, oh, I'd love the garden center. So I'd be like, okay. So I began going to the garden. <laughs> She's like, maybe not always. So I began going to the garden center with Debbie. And you know what? As I grew to love Debbie, I began to enjoy being with her more and more. And I just wanted to be with her. I just wanted to do the things that she enjoyed because I loved her and she loved me. And that changed my desires. It changed what I wanted to do because in the end, the activity wasn't the important thing anymore. Actually, the relationship was the more important thing. It was the relationship that motivated me in my actions. And that's what it's like with God. God comes and he shows us how much he loves us. He shows us how much he loves us in Jesus dying for us. He adopts us into his family. The more sp time we spend with him as we pray, as we worship him, the more we grow to love him, the more we realize how much he loves us. And the more we love him, the more we just want to do the things that he loves. And the more we love him, the more we don't want to do the things that he hates and that, he, that grieve him. And we don't want to do the things that grieve him because we love him. So our actions change. God works in our lives and he works in our will. He shapes what we want to do. He changes our desires. Now, of course, it's not as though we never sin because there are still other things which appeal to us and appeal to our, our fleshly body, appeal and tempt us. We still battle against sin and the flesh and, and the devil. And, and some people face temptations and they're a real battle for them. And, and sometimes they can think, I don't even know if I'm a Christian because I just struggle with this temptation the whole time. You know, these are battles that we're in all the time. The, the question that we should ask ourselves, because some people, they wonder even if they're a Christian when they bat battle against temptation. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what is our deepest desire? What is the thing that we want the most? Because if the thing that you want the most is, well, I really just want to do these things, and, and I know it's sin, but that's what I want the most, and I want to be rebellious, and I want to do this, and I, you know, I, I don't care about any of those other things. I don't care about what God thinks. Well, if that's where you are, actually, your heart does need to change before your actions change. You need a new heart. You need to become a Christian. You need to realize that Jesus died for that rebellious attitude, to forgive us, to bring us into relationship with him. You can receive that today. You can receive forgiveness even today and become a new person, receive a new heart. But if the thing that you want to do the most is to please Jesus, if you want to love him and you say, do you know what, I just battle and it's so hard and I've got, but I really want to please him, well then, you can be comforted to know that you are a Christian, that God is working in you, and there's hope that you can change. If you're worried that you're not a Christian, it's probably a good sign that you are. And God doesn't want to look at us and just say, I want to change your behavior. It's not about behavior modification. God looks at us and wants to give us a new heart. He wants to change our hearts. He wants to change our desires. And when we get a new heart, he'll give us new will. He'll give us new desires. So as we work things out, as he works in us, we find that we're more bothered about who we love and we replace old patterns of behavior with new patterns of behavior. You know, you might think, well, I really want to give up drinking too much. I really want to stop eating too much. I, I really want to stop lying. I really want to stop watching unhelpful things on the internet or on TV. I really want to stop gossiping. I know I battle with those things. All of those things are fruit. They have the fruit of our lives. And it doesn't always help to focus in on the fruit. We don't fix on those things. I need to change those things. It's much better to look at the root of things. Work on the relationship that you've got with Jesus. Spend time getting to know how much he loves you. Work on feeding the root. And as we feed the roots with good things, the fruit will begin to change. I mean, let's get specific about one of the particular things that Paul talks about here because he's speaking to the Philippians and, and they love Jesus, 
But as a church, they'd got themselves into a bit of a mess about one particular sin, one thing that they were tempted to keep doing. And that was what Paul's talking about here, grumbling and arguing. And we'll find out later on in chapter 4 that Paul mentions two women in the church who were arguing a lot, and it was causing big divisions in the church. He's probably got that in his mind here in chapter 2. Grumbling and arguing. Now, let's face it. The temptation to grumble and to argue are big temptations. Let's do a quick survey. Okay, we'll start with the kids and teenagers. Kids and teenagers, okay. How many of you never grumble about anything and never argue about anything? (laughs) There's a hand goes up and the parents quickly batting it down. (laughs) So the parents are the ones who will be able to say, yeah, it's really tough never to grumble or argue. I mean, I'm, you know, with your parents, with your brothers, with your sisters, it's a big one. Teenagers, grumbling and arguing, that's part of the job description. Like, that's, that's just there. <laughs> let, me, let me give you some comfort. Okay, adults, how many of you manage to never grumble or argue about anything? <laughs> All the hands are staying well down at this point. It's a big problem for all of us. It's a huge problem for all of us. Because if things aren't going the way we want or the way that we hoped, the temptation comes in to grumble about them. It was a problem in the Bible. We see it in the Old Testament. You remember Moses led his people out of slavery, the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. You remember how the sea, the Red Sea parted, how they went through God delivered them from slavery. But then, straight away, the temptation came in, and the people started grumbling and complaining. I mean, at first, God took them to a place where it says there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees. Sounds pretty sweet to me. But after that, he took them into the desert. And when they were in the desert, the Bible says the whole community started grumbling against Moses and his brother Aaron. And this is what it says, and this is what they said. They said, it would have been better to die in Egypt. There, we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, and now we're starving. Uh, hello? You were slaves. There were slaves in Egypt. They weren't sitting around eating pots of meat. You only have to look at what the description was in Exodus to see what was really going on. Exodus chapter 5, it says they had to make bricks every day, all day, every day. They had to make these bricks out of straw. And after a while, the Egyptians said, we're not even going to provide the straw for you. You've got to go and collect the straw, and then you've got to make the bricks. And this is how many you've got to make during the day. And if you don't make enough bricks, we're going to beat you. And that's what they did. They were slaving away as slaves all day, every day, making bricks. They weren't sitting around pots of meat with their feet up. But that's what they remember it as. They're still complaining a few years later. By the time it gets on, God is doing miracles among them. He's providing food in the desert for them. He's providing manna for them. Manna is a bit like uh, coriander seed, and it said it The Bible says it tasted like wafers made with honey. Pretty good. I can think of worse things to eat than manna. But they're still grumbling and complaining about things. In Numbers 11, it says, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, oh, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt and at no cost. Also the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. No, you were slaves. It wasn't like that. And since when did anyone want to say they want to eat cucumbers, leeks, and onions, and garlic anyway? We might wonder how the Israelites could get into complaining so easily. They've just been set free from slavery by God. God's led them through the Red Sea. They've gone through. It's closed up behind them. God's provided water miraculously for them. He's provided food. He's moved before them in a power of a pillar of fire and of cloud, but still they complain. 
Why? Because they've forgotten about the goodness of God. They're thinking about what they don't have instead of what they do have, instead of what God's given them. And they've also started to think that they could come up with a better plan than God came up with. And that's exactly the same for us too when we grumble and complain. We can forget about God's goodness. We can fix our minds and think too much about the things that we don't have instead of thinking about the things that we do have. And we can start to think that we could figure it all out a lot better than God. And so we grumble and we argue. I mean, we do it about everything. We, we complain about winter and the cold all winter. Oh, when's this winter going to end? I'm so cold. I'm so freezing. Two weeks later, it's 30 degrees, and we're like, it's so hot. I mean, like, we can't, we can't have it. We don't like it either way. We so easily forget the things that God has done for us. We forget God. We just look at the negative things. We look at our difficulties. We look at our struggles. I mean, they're real, but that's what we fix our eyes on instead of on God and what he's done for us. Oh, it's been terrible the last few months. All the things I haven't been able to do because of COVID-19. Oh, it's terrible. You know, and we can start to feel that we've been just treated very badly by God. Oh, we might say, well, actually, yeah, I know I am grumbling. I know I'm complaining about things, but to be honest, most of the things that I'm complaining about, I'm not really complaining to God. I'm not complaining about God. I'm complaining about other people. It's other people who annoy me. They're the ones who bother me. And, and so that, that's, who I'm, that's who I'm actually grumbling about. Okay. But that doesn't wash either, you see, because the people were complaining about Moses and Aaron. And Moses says in Exodus 16 and verse 9, he says to the people, the Lord has heard your grumbling against him. They might have said, we're not grumbling against God. But then he goes, who are we? You're not grumbling against us. You're grumbling against the Lord. Moses points out that when we grumble, even against other people, we're actually grumbling against God. It's him that we're dissatisfied with. He's put us in this situation. Some, now, some of you might be thinking, hang on, I, I seem to remember a few weeks ago, Joe saying, uh, you know, surely it's okay to tell God how you're feeling about things. When you're feeling sad, when you're feeling upset, even when you're feeling frustrated. Or, Joe said it was good to tell, tell God about that. And that is true. The Bible doesn't say that you can't be honest about the things that you're feeling and, they, and express them to God. If you're finding a situation difficult, that's different to grumbling. Grumbling takes it one stage further. Grumbling starts to say in our hearts, God, you've got no right to do this to me. God, this is so unfair. Why are you doing this to me? When we start telling God that he's wrong, then we're not listening to him. We're not actually seeing what he's wanting to do in our lives. We know from the Bible and from our lives that he's a good God. He's working in us all the time, and he's working in us for our own good. The Bible talks about it. He says, says sometimes he disciplines us by taking us through hard things that, might, that will produce in us a harvest of righteousness and peace. That doesn't mean that every difficult thing that we face is God's discipline, but it means it might be. It might be the thing that we're facing now. Maybe that's what God's doing. There's a difference also between questioning and having a question. Having a question is okay. But questioning gets into the like, I don't trust you. I don't trust the way you're going to do these things. I know better. And when we start questioning God, again, we're not hearing him. Instead of grumbling and questioning, why not stop to say, God, what are you trying to teach me in this difficult situation? What is it that you're doing? What is it you want me to grow in? What do I need to learn here through this situation? It's a hard question to ask when we're going through it, but those are good questions to ask. And it's also helpful to remember accurately the things God has done for us, to practice being thankful. Maybe a good thing to do this week is to actually write a list of all the things that God's done in your life which you can be thankful for. And as a church, we need to be thankful and remember how God's provided for us too how he's provided this building for us, how he's sustained us and provided for us financially, how he continues to be with us in tough times. We need to keep turning to God because the truth is he's working in us 
to will and act according to his good purpose. And then finally, there's one more reason that Paul gives us for not giving in to grumbling and arguing, and it's this. We have a responsibility toward the world. Paul says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so you may become blameless and pure, children without fault in a warped and crooked generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. We are holding out the word of life. We have the best news in the world. We have the gospel. And if we hold it out into the darkness of this world, we will shine like stars. We'll captivate people. God's love will captivate people. We'll be seen to be different from other people, not just because we're any better in and of ourselves, but because we've got the power of God living and working through us. You see, when we get caught up with grumbling and arguing with each other and with God, we forget this. We forget we've been sent to be a witness to shine as stars into our city. We forget that people are looking at us. Our families are looking at us. Our neighbors are looking at us. Our work colleagues and our school friends are looking at us. Our kids are looking at us. What is it that they're going to see? Christians looking like Jesus, reflecting the gospel of God, or Christians complaining and arguing with each other, in which case they won't think a whole lot about Jesus. Oh, they won't think much of him. Paul's saying to the Philippians, I want, to, I want you to make me proud. He's saying that in, in not so many words. I want to be able to boast about you. I want, you to, I want to be proud of you. I, I want to know that I didn't work for nothing. I don't want my effort on you to be a waste of time. That's the greatest fear of any pastor, actually, that, that what they've done is a waste of time. What we love to see is people change and live out the the grace of God, understand about it in our lives and work it out. That's the greatest desire of any pastor, to be be proud in a good way before God of of the church that they're in. We can all be proud of the church that we're in. And we love to see a church that is trusting in God, walking in faith, praying, loving to worship God, filled with the Spirit, loving God's Word, basing our lives on it, sharing the good news of Jesus about others, being mature and learning, where people uh, are serving quietly as God is working in them, not complaining, trusting in God, trusting in God's goodness, using every opportunity to grow. That's the sort of thing Paul was looking for in Philippians, uh, in, the, in Philippi. That's, that's the sort of thing that we're looking for here in this church too. Paul's going to talk next time about Timothy and Epaphroditus, two people who he's proud of, of how they've matured in Christ. But in the end, it's only as we focus our relationship on God that we're going to be able to be that people. Otherwise, it's just going to end up being hard work and a lot of effort. The good news is God is at work in us to will and act according to his good purpose. He's changing our hearts. And because he's changed our hearts, And it's changing our hearts, it's changing how we live. So church, don't go away today feeling I've got a list of things to do. I've got to really work hard at not grumbling, not arguing. What we need to do today is go away and think, how can I remind myself of the gospel every day? How can I keep receiving God's love, which he gives freely to us? How can I keep reminding myself about God and how much he loves me, how much he's for me? And as we do that, the temptations which come our way won't seem anywhere near as attractive compared to the wonder of the living God who knows us and who loves us. Why don't we pray together? If you're here today, why don't you just stand up as I pray? Angela's going to come back up and she's going to lead us in some worship. Father God, I thank you that you do love us. You thank you. You've shown that love in Jesus. And God, I want to pray that we'll keep our eyes fixed on you. We'll keep reminding ourselves of the beautiful truth of the gospel. And we'll trust that you keep working in us to will and to act according to your good purposes. God, keep changing our hearts. Keep leading us more into godliness to be more like Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.